we have a great opportunity here for our next keynote speaker uh, to discuss advancing women's leadership in the marit maritime competencies, policies, and practices, delivered none other by Rear Admiral Antoinette Gorman, who is the only female chief of defense in the world. So it is our pleasure uh, on behalf of coming from the Jamaican Defense Force to have you here, ma'am. Uh, the moderator will be Admiral Retired Guillermo Barrera of the Colombian Navy. Admiral Barrera has held many positions here, including the commander of the Colombian Navy. He also uh, is a Naval War College graduate and a current professor here. Please assist me in welcoming Admiral Guillermo Barrera to the stage. Sorry, this is going to be one of the wonderful Newport days, but you never know in the morning. <laughs> what a tremendous opportunity I feel that I'm blessed to introduce today, ladies and gentlemen, Rear Admiral, correction, Vice Admiral Select. Antoinette Gorman. She is the Chief of Jamaica Defense Staff. She has been instrumental in a process of transformation of the Jamaica Defense Forces for most of her life. And she has a long time experience. She is one of those people you can say is a practitioner She's making things happen, which makes a tremendous difference. So instead of reading her bio, which I think all of you can have the access, I would like to probably emphasize on some, I would say, critical areas of her life. First of all, she has more than 30 years of experience in her work. She has been developing her work. She's a Naval War College graduate of the N Naval Staff College class of 2009. And I think she's starting to do better than my class, which that never happened before. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> she enjoyed her stay here in the War College because, as she says, because of the diversity of the personnel and academic experience, as well as professors that gave ex excellent education, and particularly she remembers with a tremendous affect and gratitude her interactions in NSA. I think that very few people can say that they have been participating in four international sea power symposiums. She has three regional alumni symposiums, but many other events, international events, all over the world, including China. Her last line command was Brigade Commander of the Maritime Air and Cyber Command, a unique structure which she stood up as part of the transformation of the Jamaica Defense Force into a division-sized force. Vice Admiral Gorman has been instrumental, as I said, in the successful transformation of the Jamaica Defense Force. She is the first female officer to be commanding officer of the Jamaican Defense Force Coast Guard, and the first female officer to obtain a rank, a rank flag, a flag rank in 2022. And that's not all. She helps girls that have problems in her free time. But she also works in her garden 30 minutes every day. Not today. <laughs> well, not today, she's right. And she also spends time every day for meditating, exercising, family, and giving enough time for every important part of her life, active and working. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Antoinette Gorman will present to you the theme Advancing Women Leadership in Maritime Competencies, Policies and Practices. Please give her a welcome. Thank you, Admiral Guillermo. Rear Admiral Peter Garvin, President of the US Naval War College. Faculty members, distinguished guests, students, good morning. Admiral, thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. I don't know if I get to do 30 minutes every day in the garden, but I at least look to ensure that things are still the way they were yesterday. I'm really happy to be back here at the Naval War College. As Admiral mentioned, I was a student here in 2008, 2009. It was, I have to say, the best year of my uh, career in terms of professional development. And of course, back then, I was the lone female in a class of 34 students, international students, from 33 different countries. There were two US students in my cohort. But that was no real strange space for me. I had gotten used to being the only female in the room. But I'm glad this morning I, that has progressed quite some way and I'm not the only female in the room. In fact, I remember being at Naval uh, Sea Power Symposium and thinking, you know, wow, <laughs> what am I doing here? There were lots of gold everywhere and none of it was on any female and I was just a lieutenant commander at the time uh, at the, as the head of my Coast Guard. But it's really, it was really lovely to be back here and I thank the War College for asking me to come and speak about a very important uh, matter. And this symposium is necessary and very important because the presence of women in the armed forces, um, particularly in leadership positions, cannot be overstated as we pursue a more secure world. The inclusion, I sh I'm sure yesterday, I'm sorry I missed yesterday, but I'm sure yesterday there were lots of discussions about why and why it is important to have diversity and female inclusion. So forgive me if I'm repeating something you heard before, but it's still important to say. The inclusion of gender diversity in military leadership will enhance our operational effectiveness, our resilience, and the innovative capacity of our organizations. And this is why it is important. It is not just about equality or fairness. I'm sure it would have been said already. It is a fundamental human right and it is also necessary for peace in our world. Women and girls represent just about half of the world's population, and we have a role to play and something to offer. So if women are not included in decision-making that is taken at the leadership level, we are losing out. I'm sure many of the male leaders, and I've heard this specifically said to me, oh, we never thought of it that way. You just can't if you're not uh, a woman. And we bring that different perspective to the table, which is why it is important to have women in leadership positions. This is supported, of course, we know. Uh, we, we spoke about the, the uh, WPS resolution 1325, and that is enabling or providing a framework for us to include women in these considerations uh, of peace and security. So why the discussion? I'm not sure if my slides are moving. Where do I point this? Okay. I'm sorry, where do I, do I point this? At the computer? Okay, thank you. 
Why the discussion about women's leadership in maritime competencies? Well, this audience is well aware of the history and pace of progress with gender diversity in the armed forces. The fact is, it is fact is also that diverse perspectives bring innovation and immense benefits to the table. Diverse teams are more effective at solving problems and contributing to a more dynamic and comprehensive solution. As I speak about the matter of women leadership in maritime competencies, I will look at the current state of women leadership in the maritime domain and some actionable strategies and practices. The slide you're looking at shows some women who have uh, excelled in leadership or have had the opportunity for leadership in the maritime domain. You will note that the United States is leading in this regard. And I really want to congratulate the, the United States uh, leadership, uh, military leadership in general, and the United States Navy in being a leader in that way. And through your policies and strategies, ensuring that the people you partner with, the countries you partner with, are made aware and are, are, are caused to also include and give opportunity to women. Numerous countries, yourselves, the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, India, Denmark, Caribbean nations, to list a few, have enlisted women in their naval forces. Their matriculation to leadership has been at a slow pace, as this is an era that was once off limits to women within the wider barriers to women in, in the armed forces in general. The level of advancement differs greatly from one nation to another, with some countries now permitting women to serve in nearly all combatant roles, such as ship commanders, aviators, and in senior staff roles, while others limit the role of women to support or low-level appointments. There is, however, positive momentum. As I said, 15 years ago, there would not have been so many women in this room. As women attain top positions in combatant and staff appointments, it also reflects a broader change in societal views on gender roles and the competence of women in leadership. Notwithstanding these advances, data provided by NATO indicates that the percentage of female active duty personnel in the armed forces of 27 of its member states varies significantly, ranging from 20% to as low as 0.3%. The latter percentage specifically report, reported by Turkey. Similarly, India also has a minimal number of female recruits, with data from the Indian Department of Defense indicating an overall enlistment rate of 0.7%. The limiting factor for women's involvement are centered around existing perspectives on gender role and diversity. And studies have shown that gender bias in decision making can be pervasive, harmful, and widespread, leading to different outcomes for women and harming the organization's decisions. In exploring promotion biases in organizations, researchers Oster and Passad in 2016 found that participating in deliberate or unintentional gender bias originated from societal norms and gender stereotyping of leadership behaviors inhibited women from achieving top leadership positions. Another limiting factor is a lack of mentorship, specifically in the maritime domain. The male-dominated structure limits the number of female leaders who are able to mentor and guide their colleagues. The result is that women may possess self-limiting perspectives on their ability to advance to leadership roles in their trade. This is not to say that females need only be mentored by another female. It is important for male leaders to be inclusive in their mentorship of their subordinates. In my personal experience, my progress as the first female to be afforded the opportunity to serve at the Jamaica Defense Force Coast Guard was on account of several forward-thinking male leaders who mentored and guided me. It is critical that in a male-dominated environment, it is also critical that women develop a good sense of self-assurance and self-belief. Mentorship will help 
But in my case, I was also unconsciously, I also unconsciously brought a good sense of self-worth and perhaps naivety. I was fortunate to have been socialized to think that I could do anything, and so I did not perceive a limitation. I didn't know I was not supposed to be able to go to sea. So even when it was presented as the status quo, I couldn't understand it. And so I was there and I had to be heard. And I was therefore given that opportunity, not, not without a little fight. <laughs> in some cases, there is also a lack of supportive policies for women inclusion. Policies serve to break down barriers to women's progress in male-dominated industries. So let us talk about some best practices and appropriate policy models. Advancing women's leadership in maritime competencies will require actionable strategies that promote gender diversity and inclusivity. In the context of the Jamaica Defense Force, we adopted a strategic approach to gender equity in the service, which has yielded success. In the first district of the Jamaica Defense Force, female enlisted service members account for 12.5% of active duty members. Among the officer corps, the percentage is higher, with female officers accounting for 23%. For the second district, the female enlisted mem service members account for 13%, and in the officer corps, 23%, respectively. Women have advanced to leadership roles, serving as commanding officers, ship captains, and across all trades of the JDF Coast Guard. That area of the Jamaica Defense Force was ahead of the other arms of the Jamaica Defense Force in terms of gender diversity. And it was as a result of a direct buy-in by the leadership of the Coast Guard. It was also as a result of the highly publicized and monitored progress of service women's careers in this area. This demonstrates the importance of strategies that ensure visibility on the tangible examples for women to see themselves in the roles and the possibilities available. A critical first step for the JDF was to mandate gender equity in all training programs. Ensuring females had access to maritime training played an instrumental role in increasing female leadership in the JDF Coast Guard. This meant that the gender lens had to be applied to policies to ensure the environment, the kit and equipment were enabling. I must tell you, when I joined the Coast Guard, and you can barely see me above this lectern, uh, Admiral, this lectern is not really gender optimized. <laughs> when I joined and, got, and went on my first ship, well, it started when I was training in the UK that I really could not reach the compass rows because of my height. And I had to build a stool to take with me on the bridge so I could stand to see, to, to properly be able to, um, maneuver the compass. And similarly, when I went to my first ship, uh, that those days the radars had these huge things covering them and, and you had to peep down into the radar. And of course, again, I, could, I couldn't reach. So I had to, I, I walked, I literally spent my entire sea career walking around with, with a, a, a small stool so I could reach things. And that was just one very simple example, but, but of course, Policies, there were no considerations around, okay, so now we're gonna have female service members um, in the Coast Guard, not even about what my uniform would be and what, what, what adjustments would be required to, to ensure that uh, it was appropriate. In fact, my, my, my bosses thought I, I was going to wear a skirt around the ship and I thought, uh, no, <laughs> they're ladders, you know, so, <laughs> Very, <laughs> yeah. So, so you have to apply a gender lens to a lot of things um, to ensure that women are given equal opportunity to access professional development um, and training. The exclusion of women based on stereotypes or unconscious bias must be identified and removed. And this is done by ensuring matriculation based on individual competencies and proficiencies, regardless of gender or cultural norm. 
I'm still trying to figure out, get this to actually move with my finger, with my pressing thing, but anyway. Uh, and the, does it work on here? No. The, ch the strategy of implementing quotas could be uh, challenging. It could prevent access to a competent service member because of his or her gender. However, gender quotas have been effective in breaking initial barriers, especially at the leadership level. A quota-based approach requires balancing mechanisms to ensure equity, which includes layered approval, oversights of audits, and appointment of gender advisors or focal points at varying levels. Policies and practice, practices to promote inclusivity can be categorized into three areas. I'm going to use the strategic, the operational, and the tactical um, to describe this. Strategically, you need those uh, F those things like the WPS, the US um, Act uh, for, I, I'm, I'm, it's eluding me what it's called, um, what's your WPS Act, thank you very much. Those are strategic things that are enablers for diversity. You must include women in the decision making process. In my own organization, we have promulgated a gender optimization policy which mandates inclusion in all aspects of training, operations, and professional development. The force policy reviews, review process mandates that all review committees must include a female service member. A force gender advisor also sits on all decision-making bodies at the strategic level allowing for a systematic account of gender-related matters. I'll give another simple example. As a force executive officer, uh, I was the only female on the general staff board that, made, that you know, approved all the policies in the force. And we were looking at uh, our, our honors and awards and how they would be arranged um, how you would wear them on the uniform and such the like. And everyone in the room thought, well, we'll start to overlap the medallions after we get to five, which would not work on my chest. Um, and at the time, it would not work on the then chief of defense staff, although he was male, was just about, he's quite a petite gentleman. Um, and so I insisted that we should allow for the overlap from three. Now, this is something that a, a normal average male would not think about because it, it doesn't affect you and, you would not, and they would not understand. So it's very important, very small nuances that have significant impact. So now, um, I, 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 I'm, fortunately, I'm able to overlap my medals and they can fit on, on the uniform um, on my, of, of my size. So policies are important, but they're also, mechan you ha also have to have mechanisms to monitor and to balance. It's, it's not one in, 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 in um, at the expense of another, but, but really optimization, and that is why we don't call it a gender um, equality policy, we call it a gender optimization policy um, in the Jamaica Defense Force. Operational considerations. We have to create safe and conducive environment for women inclusion. The intent is to make an active commitment at all levels of the chain of command to change mentalities and internal cultures so that gender differences can, sorry, so that gender, I lost my, my, my space on my thing, sorry. We, the intent is to make an active commitment at all levels of the chain of command to change mentalities and internal culture so that gender differences are positively accepted and accounted for. Operational spaces require modification for female service members, appropriate barrack, uniform, kit, and equipment, making their, them more suitable for female bodies, for example, this would not necessarily be considered if the policymaker is blind to the need or the nuance. Operational considerations should also include policies that create a safe and respectful operational environment. So that requires 
tackling institutional practices, biases, and hostility towards women. They include things like sexual harassment prevention and fraternization policies. For these policies to be effective, there will need to be a zero tolerance approach to their application and enforcement at all levels of command. Training and education form a very critical component of at the strategic and operational level. You have to ensure that everyone is familiar and understands the direction, allowing them to participate in the necessary cultural change. At the tactical level, considerations that enable and support female advancement include the examination and dissolution of combat in exclusive practices against women. The typical concerns for excluding women from combat roles, including neg negative impacts on unit cohesion, lack of mental capacity, or limited physical strength and capabilities have not been supported by research according to a Military Leadership Diversity Commission article in 2010. Women should therefore be given equal opportunity for training in tactical functions to include kinetic, mobility, and reconnaissance, and whatever else they are able to do. They should also be involved in tactical decision-making, allowing for a diversity of opinion and combat strategy. What can you do? At this point, I will propose some practices that we can all use to influence the advancement of women's leadership in maritime competencies. The first crucial step is leadership commitment to gender diversity and inclusion. Command should be open to women inclusion and leadership, creating the atmosphere and opportunity for their advancement. Leaders at all levels of the chain of command must also commit to upholding gender-based policies, practices, and frameworks for operation, uh, operational and mission success. Recruitment. Once you get the operational culture, the organizational culture, sorry, on track, then how do you continue to have women included and interested in positions that bring them into maritime uh, leadership in a maritime space? Focus on dynamic recruiting and promotion process. A practical approach would be a the visible inclusion of women at the strategic, operational, and tactical level. If the intent is to deliberately increase female members in maritime competencies, a practical approach is to ensure that other women see that the opportunities exist. I use, in the JDF, I use the JDF's youth and community engagement line of effort to promote this. When we do recruiting, we always ensure that you show women, active duty women, in the different disciplines in the maritime space. And, and so young girls can see that these are, are, are available opportunities for their careers. And we do it very, very actively and deliberately on all our promotional um, information on all, all the media that we use. The next point I want to speak about is mentorship. Establishing formal mentorship programs can help women navigate the challenges of the maritime domain. These programs can pair emerging female leaders with seasoned service members who can offer guidance, support, and advocacy. Women can then encourage each other in this domain. But again, I want to reiterate that this mentorship is not limited to women being mentors. Males provide very good mentorship and opportunity to, to women as well. We also have to conduct regular gender sensitivity training and events such as these because there are unconscious biases that we all have. This training is very important, especially for those in leadership and operational roles and will help create a more respective and inclusive military environment. And then now I'm going to speak to the women who have had the opportunity for leadership. We must send the elevator back down. This is very important. 
Female leaders must recognize their position and opportunity to send the elevator back down, to bring others up. Too often, female leaders unconsciously manifest a negative approach towards junior females, thereby not providing an opportunity for guidance to those women who need it. By committing to some of these strategies and actions, leadership in maritime competencies can move closer to achieving gender parity, thereby enriching the domain with diverse perspectives. As I close, I must reiterate that the inclusion of women in maritime leadership is not just a moral obligation, it is a strategic necessity. As we navigate the complexities of modern conflicts and strive for a peaceful and secure world, the unique perspectives and capabilities that women bring are indispensable. Let us commit ourselves to breaking the barriers that prevent women from rising to leadership positions within our armed forces and ensuring that our respective forces are diverse, capable, and resilient as the societies they aim to protect. Again, Admiral, I commend the US War College for its efforts in highlighting this important issue. And thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. I look forward to any questions and discussions. Thank you. Well, we just heard about practice together with theory. And I think that is a very important step forward. Um, initially, I had some questions, but I'm going to change them a little bit. I hope that you will accept that. The first question regarding your bio, bio because I found there that you had a phrase at the end of your bio. And it says, how you do anything is how you do everything. My question is, how do you apply this for your normal day-to-day -day work? And how is that influencing your people? But I think they're tired of hearing me say it, uh, because I say it every time. And, and essentially, what I mean is um, just do everything the, the best way you can, because how you do anything is how you do everything. That's, that's, that's essentially what I mean. So I try, uh, how do I apply it? I give it my best shot every time. Thank you. Second question. And we have seen that in the screen most of the time. Hard power, smart power, or soft power, or a combination? All of the above. Why? Because different scenarios require a different uh, approach, and um, and sometimes a combination uh, is useful. Sometimes you you will only need um, one or other. But I think all of the above is you have them in your toolbox, then you can use them. Thank you very much. Another question that I have is: you are setting up benchmarks in your country and in the neighborhood and in France. Looking forward into the future, when nobody in this audience will be there. In 100 years, what would you like to be remembered for? Oh, um, I've never. <laughs> I think I, I, I want to be remembered for the, the advances that I would have made and the influences and impact that I would have had um, on everybody and uh, all the people I've led, um, worked for, worked with, encountered. Um, I expect uh, by default it, it will likely focus on um, impact on women and girls. Um, because that has become a very important part of my job. As I indicated, it is important for women in leadership positions with the opportunity to, to send that elevator back down. And so I think those are some of the things I would uh, want people to talk about. Thank you very much. You know, it's one of the conditions that I think of leaders. When leaders start thinking, in our, is what I'm doing something that is going to affect other lives? 
The question is, how do I want it to be affected? Positively, negatively? What is going to be my inheritance for them? Not exactly for me, as you are mentioning, but probably how other people will be much better performing and doing things, which I, did, I think is a fantastic lesson. Thank you so much. So in that direction and touching about the youngsters especially, how would you describe your leadership style? What advice would you give to the young women, not only in Jamaica, but around the world, who aspire to lead defense and security sectors institutions? Oh, could, you, uh, could you repeat, like, how would I? You say, what advice would you give to young women, okay. not only in Jamaica, but around the world, who aspire to lead defense and security sector institutions? Well, I think when I speak to young women and girls, um, I say to them that they should not put themselves in a box. Um, I think that's the most important thing, that you, you value yourself and you, you can see yourself um, achieving whatever it is you put your mind to. And then, of course, they are, the realities are there that you will encounter obstacles along the way. Uh, but perseverance, hard work, ensuring that you make yourself as uh, competent as possible to be able to earn your, your place at the table. No one is going to give it to you, earn your place at the table, uh, 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 and show up for work every day. How you do any, anything is how you do everything. Thank you so very much. What does the international community need to do differently and more effectively to integrate women in the defense sector? I think we are making uh, progress in, in most um, regions of the world uh, in terms of certainly starting from a UN perspective with the WPS um, resolution that mandates certain things. But internationally, uh, governments and military organizations have to commit um, from top down to ensuring diversity and inclusion. And, and, and to do that, they have to make policies, uh, monitor and implement uh, them, ensure that they are going all the way down the various levels, and provide the, the opportunities, which includes ensuring that women are, are trained, their environment allows them to be included, and they get a seat at the table. So we have to continue to uh, open and keep the door open for diversity and, and, and inclusivity um, at all levels. Thank you, thank you very much. Tell us, I know that you are very humble. Tell us about your own leadership story because you have things to teach. You have things to help other people in which you have been suffering and struggling about along your life. But those lessons are very important because they are practical lessons. So tell us about your own leadership story as the only woman chief of defense of the world currently. What were the barriers you overcome and what were the opportunities you, said you seized? I'll start with the last think first, what were the opportunities I seized? Uh, so, um, in 19, maybe I shouldn't tell the, the date. <laughs> when, in, in, in 1992, uh, the head of the Jamaica Defense Force was a naval officer, Rear Admiral Peter Brady. He's an alumni of the War College as well. And um, I, I was a, a young officer cadet um, being trained at uh, the, our training um, depot, which is up in the hills of Jamaica. Uh, I had never met the chief of defense staff, 
uh, and uh, it, as it happened, there, there was uh, an event. Um, we had a national election and the staff in the training facility were the chief of staff reserve uh, for a particular operation to support the elections. And I had completed my training. Uh, I had indicated that I wanted to uh, become a naval officer and I was told no. So I was still in the training um, environment waiting to, I, I guess they were waiting for me to change my mind or, or grow some, some sense so that they could send me on a normal um, uh, training course that was not a naval officer training course. And so I, was form, I formed a part of the, the platoon that supported the chief of staff um, uh, reserve. However, uh, when they sent for the platoon, um, and I, I, I was a signaler, uh, and I joined the air, I was you know, mustering and ready to join the aircraft with my rifle and my radio, my, uh, my depot sergeant major said, you know, well, where are you going? I said, well, sir, I'm the, sig I'm the signaler, and, and they, I'm going on, you know, I have the radio. And he goes, go and turn, turn the radio over to that guy and turn your weapon in. Oh, you can't go anywhere, you're a woman. And I went, uh, so I, 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 I just couldn't comprehend. So he turned around and I just joined the aircraft and the aircraft left. <laughs> and, so, and, and, and I, I, I deployed and of course, when I got to where the troops were, the, the platoon commander was looking at me with his eyes wide open, you know, what are you doing here? And I'm going, why are you asking me this question? I am the signaler the radio, why are you asking me this question? The long and short of it, at the end of that, um, so this, this became real, the entire force knew because then I went on the net and I was transmitting and so on and everybody wanted to know who was this female on the radio and what was she doing there and so when I got back, I was summoned forthwith to the headquarters uh, and I met the chief, of the, the chief of staff at the time, Admiral Brady and, and, and I used the opportunity then to say, oh sir, I am the cadet who wants to be a, a, a naval officer and I would like the opportunity to do so. And, he's, and he kind of turned around to his staff and said, well, why not? So that was the beginning of my career in terms of just really standing up for yourself and, 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 and understanding that, you know, I, belo I don't see why I can't do um, what, what, the, other, what the, uh, the other guy is doing. Uh, but you also have to accept wh where your weaknesses are, because if you don't know what your weaknesses are, then you won't, you won't get the necessary help. No one person can do everything. I, I'm, um, I, I, I can probably run better than some persons, but I don't like running. Um, so I wouldn't want to be able to, you know, I have to accept things that I can't do. I can't carry around a, a, a you know, a 100 pound pack on my back, I, I, I can't. I have to accept that I can't. But in training, the things that were too heavy for me, I would ask for help. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. You have to know what your strengths are, know what your weaknesses are, and that's how you, you become a good leader. Um, so you can, you can fill your gaps with the strength from somewhere. If you think you know it all, then, then, then that makes you really a poor leader. Um, so that, uh, so that was uh, one of my, my, my biggest opportunities that I seized. In terms of, of, of leadership, ob, um, you know, stories, ob, other obstacles, was it obstacles that I faced? Um, all along the way, uh, I think the more, the more challenging ones were being um, expected to fail. So, or being, uh, or an orchestration of your failure. So you have to, there were so many up, um, times that you, know, you could see that uh, you were expected to fail or you were not being given the, the full opportunity to succeed. And so it made it that much more difficult and it made you, but it just made, made me stronger. And it was a challenge. Th thank you so much. How wonderful ideas you are giving us now. And I would like to repeat two words that you mentioned. Perseverance, hard work. Because you have, you have been building is brick by brick. You are building that building. And I think that is a tremendous lesson you are giving us today. It's small things, 
that will make the big things. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vice Admiral Select. Uh, you, I think that I should say thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your advice. And thank you for your tremendous leadership based on example with a positive vision of the world. Thank you so very much. Thank you.